I welcome everyone and I hope we're going to have a good time talking about teaching young learners, especially in the um, in the area of teaching grammar. So I'm going to take you on an adventure uh, with the young grammar detectives and we are going to drag along a very important figure with us who is the um, exemplary detective who's going to help us uh, illustrate the way in which we can um, teach our young learners grammar. So uh, because we are going to um, join the detectives, we need to work along their ways. And we start with the investigative board in which we are going to pin grammar as a prime suspect. And we're going to connect it with uh, looking at meaning versus form, which will be uh, first under our investigation. And then we move to detective skills, the essential ones of deduction and induction. And uh, we are going to open some new cases to see uh, detectives in action as examples of how the detectives work in a classroom uh, investigating grammar and we'll finish off with um, ready to take uh, ready-made investigative techniques of interrogation and document analysis and chain of evidence uh, that the students can do in the classroom and then you can try out with them and I'm sure that they are going to enjoy them as they are the little detectives in the classroom. Um, so we'll start with a uh, quote uh, from Sherlock, uh, who, um, who doesn't like being bored, okay? And I'd say that the word boredom comes to the mind of students when they hear the word grammar, uh, because this is not the most exciting, typically, thing that they associate language with. And at the very beginning of education, with the young learners and very young learners, I've learned that if you introduce grammar as a fascinating part of language, it can be exciting. And the student's attitude towards grammar may be set to um, being ex excitable at the very beginning of their education. And then they might not get bored by hearing the word grammar later on in their education, because they will associate it with the fun that comes uh, with investigating the structure, because it is fun. And if you think about yourselves as teachers, as linguists, it is fun for us. It is exciting to sort of dig into the language. Somehow, for the general public, not so much fun, but we can make it fun and we can start with the young learners. So on that positive note of not uh, having children uh, bored with grammar, we are going to have a look at what grammar actually is. So we are going to look at grammar, our prime suspect of our investigation. So when you hear the word grammar, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, the most general understanding of grammar, like the most basic one, is that grammar is a formal system of rules that govern sentence formation. Now, what does that mean? What kind of rules do we have? Well, these are the, the under, language underlying rules that make sure that our sentences are formed in such a way that they are understandable. That's why we can make a sentence like grammar detectives are searching for clues is a correct sentence grammatically formed, whereas for clues grammar detectives searching are is rather Yoda. Sort of grammar is meant for such mistakes not to occur. OK, so that's the, that's the main reason why language actually has uh, grammar. But grammar carries both meaning and form. Typically, when we think about grammar, we think about the form, form of the language, form, the, the structure of the language. But grammar is meaningful. It's not all structure. It's not all maths. It's also science. It's, it's also uh, the art. It's also the meaning, right? So if we uh, say grammar detectives are searching for clues versus grammar detectives were searching for clues, the structure of the sentence doesn't change much. But the reality described by the sentence changes dramatically, right? So here the, the, the focus is on the meaning because here the grammar element carries the meaning, right? This is what makes our understanding of the world better and wider. It's not only the words, the vocabulary that carries meaning, but also grammar. And we have to make our students aware of that very early on so that don't, they don't think about grammar as only the building blocks, but also the carriers of meaning. Uh, Sherlock says that we should not trust general impressions, but we should take deep 
dig deeper and look at the details. And this is what uh, grammar is perfect for. And this is what children like, because it's like the mystery, like looking for clues, looking for patterns. That's what grammar is. And that's what form and meaning is about. And how, how do we introduce that, or translate it into classroom language? Now, I'm going to uh, run and a short experiment uh, with you. I really hope that not all of you know it, because it's a very famous one. Um, this is a sentence. All and behold is a sentence. I saw the published plaster golening be grant the brook. Uh, do you understand the sentence? Oh, I have to look at the chart so that I can see you actually. Okay. Do you understand the sentence? No. Lovely, Laura, because the sentence has words that do not exist. But you are not supposed to understand it, but uh, they look like English. Okay, they they hold the English structure of grammar of language system. Okay, so no, we don't understand the sentence, but if I ask you specific questions, you will be able to tell me. Okay, so if I ask you, for example, what was the Flester doing? What was the Flester doing? Golening, very good. That was very fast, Jan. Golening, the Flester was golening. What does it mean? Nobody knows, but it doesn't matter because we know that Flester was golening. Regardless of the fact that we don't know what Flester is, what golening is, we get the idea. Uh, and where was he doing it? Where was he golening? Big Grand de Brac, lovely. Okay, that's it. Uh -huh, he was golening Big Grand de Brac. It doesn't matter that we have no idea what he's saying. Okay, what kind of a Flester was he? Do you know? Palglish, lovely, that's Chris' uh, first one. Okay, it's a Palglish Flester. Okay, now it seems as if you do understand the sentence. Okay, the sentence makes no sense. There is no meaning in the sentence, but there is form. Okay, and we are focusing on the form. How do we know? We know by the endings of the words because we know how words are structured. And Shemaila says that it's the order of the words in English. Luckily for us, English has a set order of um, or it's in a sentence, so we can guess uh, quite well from the sentence what part of speech they are, what's going on. Now, this is this is a very important feature, uh, important skill for the students to learn for exams, for example, when they don't understand every word, so they don't give up, but they look at the structure and try to guess what the words, what the function of the word is in a sentence. Okay. Now, this is the same sentence, but now in plain English. I saw the new patient hurrying along the corridor. Okay. And now we are focusing not on the form, but we are focusing on meaning. So I've got totally different questions for you. Okay. Now, the first one is what patient did the author see? How is the patient described? New, the new one. Very good. He's the new patient. Okay. Now we're focusing on the meaning. It was a new patient. So one who has just arrived or one that the author has not seen before, right? This carries meaning for the author. How about did he see the whole action or just a moment of the action? That's a good one. Just a moment. Very good. Uh huh. He saw just a moment because of the form of the verb. You know that it was a momentary action. It's just like a glimpse of a situation that's quite advanced to know, right? Uh, and this is what the grammar tells you, not the vocabulary. Okay. And when did the action take place? Like, what's the time reference? future past okay past because you're looking at the verb and you know it's past okay now this is how grammar carries meaning of course there are also other elements of information that are hidden in the sentence so if i asked you where does this situation take place you would probably know that it might be a hospital or a health center because you would identify a patient right being in a place like that that would be the first um the first thing you'd say also if i if i asked you what's the job of the author of the sentence let's see what do you think the job of the author of the sentence is i saw the new patient a doctor okay that couldn't be a doctor right so this is the, the first thing that comes to your mind that's because of the stereotypes right you've got an archetype of a, a person that can be found in a hospital it must be a patient could be a nurse okay actually it could be absolutely anyone 
okay like uh, yeah, a shrink uh, it could be it could be a plumber right just often coming to the same hospital uh, taking care of it but the first thing that comes to your mind is not a plumber or a detective okay the, uh, the, the another patient it could be right a paramedic you would go around the the people who work in hospitals uh so yeah so this is how we draw meaning from a sentence from the form of the grammar from the meaning of the grammar and from our general knowledge of the world uh, so yeah, this is how grammar also carries meaning, not only the form. How do we learn that? How does it happen that such a complicated thing, you know, you start teaching English to the children and you tell them, you know that in English there are 12 tenses. I disagree, there are three, like in all other languages and the rest is just additions. But anyway, you say, well, it's so complicated, right? Languages are very, very complicated. Now for a young child, it doesn't matter what language they're learning, they will learn it. Okay, so how does it happen that this grammar comes? Now, linguists have a lot of tests um, that uh, show how children learn grammar. By the end of, uh, by, by the age of five-ish, six-ish, children, uh, children's um, acquisition of first language grammar is more or less complete. Okay, so how do we know? Well, we give them a WAG test. Okay, a WAG test is an interesting test in which uh, students are shown non-existent animals. Okay, so they are shown pictures like that. These are the actual footages. That's why the, the, the font is an old one. It's an old test, but it's still running. Um, a WAG test, the original one, has got a WAG. This is a WAG. Okay, now there's another one. Now there are two of them. There are two. There are two what? WAGs. Yeah, Chris, Chris was, you were faster than my question. Yeah, there are two WAGs. Okay. Here's another animal. Have a look at this one. This is a gatch. Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two gatches. Okay, now John was faster. <laughs> okay, lovely. There are two gatches. Okay, and, and there is also a version with a verb. Okay, so we've got uh, this. This is a man who knows how to rig. He's rigging. Yeah, he did the same yesterday. Okay, what did he do? He rigged. Okay. Ah, Joanne goes one step uh, further. Okay, I'll get there. Now, how do you know? How do you know? These words do not exist. There are no such animals. There's no such action. And yet, you make a hypothesis. This is what children do. Okay? And children make the hypotheses and they test them. Okay? So, of course, like Jana wrote, uh, Rick may or may not be a regular verb but the general rule is that first of all check whether this verb is regular okay like make it make an assumption this word may be regular okay give it regular and if you're corrected then you'll know it's irregular okay uh, with the plurals of the of the nouns it comes naturally okay because it's it's the uh, phonetic things so um Yes, yeah, so, so you go for the general thing first. Okay, that's important because children, native children, acquire verbs or generally the language. If uh, if you let your second language learners acquire it the same way, they will follow the same path. Okay, and it's a very interesting path. So when a native child of English starts to learn the past tense of the verb to go, they go through stages. Okay, and the first stage is generalizing, right? So they hear to go, they make a generalization that perhaps it's a regular verb, and they go with gold. And so they are corrected. They are corrected, obviously, and with time, they get to know that the past tense of go is went, but they do something incredibly interesting. They forget that went is not a basic uh, verb, but it's already passed. So they generalize again. And they go with wanted. And finally, in the end, they get to the stage in which they actually get the right answer. The reason why I'm showing you that is uh, to tell you that if your learners, young learners, learning English as a second language, as a foreign language, go through these stages, that's perfect. It's evidence of learning. Okay. So it's not a mistake, you know, to be punished. This is something that tells you that children are learning. They are using their hypotheses and they are they are trying and they understand that you add something, that there is a process. So they do make the mistakes. You know, you just tell them that's great. That's per perfect. That's fantastic. You're not there yet, but you're getting there. OK, you are learning. This is actually actually a very good evidence. Um, OK, 
because intuitions are not to be ignored okay children have intuitions they have intuitions in the second language as well and they will be testing hypotheses and if they do let them because this is your evidence of learning um and they they are they are curious about different forms and they will experiment with grammar as well and sometimes they will be right and if they get to it on their own they will remember it better this is what we call incidental learning now if you think of your own uh, learning uh, you will have noticed it many many times that you that the students ask you for a word in english for example and you know the word and it's like a word from you know a totally different sphere of life and somehow you know that right and 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 you're surprised yourself that you know a word like that and you have absolutely no idea where you know it from okay now that's the evidence of incidental learning a good example um i swear to you i promise that you have never had a lesson in which a teacher of english sat you in the classroom and said Hello class, today is a very important lesson. Today we are going to learn all the swear words in English. So take good notes. I'm going to dictate all the dirty words in English and you will have the translations and we will, we will put them in context so that you know all the swear words in English. It has never happened ever in your life, I swear. And yet you have quite a good lexicon of uh, swear words, I'm sure, okay? That's incidental learning. You just learned it somehow, okay? Through context. And this is what children do in the classroom as well. If we let them, if we give them enough examples, this will happen also with grammar if we give them a lot of examples. OK, which means that during the class, we need to focus on both form and meaning. Right. So if we are practicing, I don't know, uh, future forms, we are not only drawing the student's attention to the verb that they are going to use, but to the actual meaning of uh, what is going to happen uh, in, in in the text, what the sentence is actually about, and they can react to the sentence. And this is also personalizing the language for them. Okay, so in in this example, you've got some sentences about the future, and you make assumptions what's going to happen, and then immediately after that, we've got uh, something that we call immediate creativity, right? So you've just introduced a phrase, a, a structure. It's new, but you activate it immediately. Okay, so here's a, a discussion uh, between two students that are that is using the newly learned uh, verbs. Um, a, the, a very good idea, a very good uh, sort of material to use for focusing both on form and meaning at the same time is comparing pictures, right? So you've got uh, comparing pictures, you can find differences, but you can also talk about the differences. In this particular example, it's about uh, past, right? So what was happening? like the differences between two pictures okay now yesterday the tiger was dancing and today the tiger is walking yesterday the, the ants were walking and now they're climbing or whatever uh, but you can use it for the future you can use it for uh for model verbs you can use it for whatever you can not not, not only uh tell the students to um circle the differences but also tell them to make sentences that are grammatically correct between uh, those uh pictures that they can compare um yeah so when we are giving the students the a lot of examples a lot of input a lot of context we are walking along the lines of sherlock who is very much for collecting data first and drawing conclusions later okay so he he's definitely for induction rather than deduction as a, a detective now in our classroom full of little detectives we will have such and such okay so what are the differences okay when you when you are teaching grammar you can go along the lines of deduction or induction uh, the difference is in treating the beginning and ending uh, of rule and example okay so in my analogy the rule is a recipe and the examples is the food that you make according to the recipe first and there are different two different types of people right first type of people will read the recipe as it is and then make the pizza okay so start with the rule and then go with the examples that's deduction other group of people will do a different thing they will come into the kitchen take all the things they have uh, in their uh, drawers and say okay now i'm gonna make a pizza 
I'll try this and that. I'll put some tomatoes, I'll put some ham, I'll put some uh, chocolate and I'll put some bananas. And some, some of the examples will be good and some will be bad. So they will be testing and they will find that the best pizza is for example, the one with tomatoes and ham. And they say, okay, so I'm, now we are going to draw a rule. This is how you make a pizza that actually tastes good. And that's induction, okay? Another analogy is um, people's attitude towards new equipment, electronic equipment. There are people who get a new equipment. I mean, I don't know, like a, a new laptop, computer, whatever. And before they start using it, they read the manual. They read the manual, they do everything according to the manual. They check it, okay? And then they know how it works. That's deduction. And there is another group of people that gets new equipment and presses all the different buttons to see what happens, okay? Hopefully not destroying the equipment presses all the buttons and then draws conclusion, okay? And okay, so it means that if we press this button, it will turn something on, okay? That's induction, okay? So from examples to the rule. How does it work in the classroom? Now in the classroom, induction is when you give the students the context first, okay? So there is a text, there, it's, um, th th there is a uh, short um, story, okay? We've got a comic. And this comic has to be clear in terms of context. Okay, so there are pictures, the sentences are short, they are simple, language is simple. And in this context, you can see a few examples of the new grammar. And you're starting with this. Okay, so the students are reading and we are focusing on the meaning. We are focusing on the meaning and the structure is acquired as a byproduct. Okay, or we are looking at a dialogue in which there is this new um, new structure. And we are following the dialogue. It's simple. All the other vocabulary is known. So the only thing that is new is the new structure. And because of the context, because of the examples, it becomes clear. And for the students who are like Sherlock Holmes, inductive learners, they would like that because they don't want to be given everything straight away. They want to, to uh, find the rule on their own. It's like a mystery. It's like a puzzle. Okay. I will find out how it works. Okay. How, how it's formed, how it's structured. This is the way they will enjoy. On the other hand, you have students who are lovers of the deductive way of learning in which they need the rule first and then the examples. So you are giving them a table, but please remember that very young learners and young learners are still concrete thinkers. They are in a phase of concrete thinking. They are going to become abstract thinkers later on. It depends on a person, but it, it um, happens somewhere in the early adolescent years when they become more abstract thinkers. At the beginning, they are very, very, very concrete thinkers. And if they're concrete thinkers, um, and grammar is a very abstract notion, it makes sense to make this grammar more tangible, something that you can actually touch, okay? So make it more graphic. And then we can give them by immediate creativity, a little bit. Oh, I like the question. I like the question. Uh, what age start uh, learning, teaching grammar? Sorry for that. Uh, you start teaching grammar from the age zero. Okay. So grammar is there. It's only the way in which you introduce it that matters. If they are young learners, you just sort of smuggle it. Okay. It's like very much in the inductive way. And when they are older and they get more interested in grammar, then you can get into more details. Okay. Back to, back to the slide. Uh, immediate creativity. So here you are using the, uh, the structure that you've just learned, but with the context. So here, first we're focusing on the form, but then immediately after that, we are focusing on the meaning. So it's not to lose the student's interest in how it works so that they don't think that we are building sentences only to build sentences. We are building sentences to convey meaning, to say something, to put the message across, okay? So what can we do to make it more tangible? I uh, highly recommend uh, Lego blocks like this, okay? So how you do it, if you're teaching some grammar, you are putting words, I don't know if you can see it, uh, words on the blocks and you need the floor and you're just putting the words on the floor, okay? Which is great because if you want a question and it's an inverted, um, it, the question is made by inversion, you just put the blocks in different uh, in different order and it works, okay? Another thing that I like to make grammar more tangible is uh, uh, word cards. Okay, let's see if you can see that. Okay, I'll get here. 
right? You got word cards, and uh, with those word cards, you give out to the students, and I tell my students to come to the front of the class, and holding uh, the card, they need to make a sentence, okay? Make a sentence out of yourselves, okay? So they make a sentence, and then I tell them, now you've got like 20 seconds to make a question, and they have to stand in different order okay so they are just holding the same card but standing in a different way in a different place to make a question and then we've got other students to come and answer the questions so again they are the answers to the question and we are playing like that because for them it's more concrete more tangible okay because they are got or they are a book or they are something and they can they can move around and they can see how the elements of the grammar work and how the structure of the sentence changes um, and again we need a little bit of immediate creativity and make it as, um, I don't know, mysterious, detective-like work as you can, then they will like it. So I've got here an activity in which they have to look into their school bag, their own school bag and say, what's that? Okay, we are practicing there is and there are, but actually they are not aware so much that they are practicing there is and there are, because it's very interesting what your friend has got in her bag. Okay, I would love to know what Grzegorz has got in his bag, really, uh, because you can, you can find out something about uh, each other in the classroom, building the team at the same time. Or investigating a picture in which you can uh, you can find the elements and here you are practicing your perception, but also a little bit of mystery here. Um, and detectives in action, what else can you do? So these are like my free ideas, not connected with any, any materials that you're using. Uh, play uh, 20 WH questions. I'm sure that you know the game, play 20 questions, but the 20 questions you only answer yes or no. And that's not enough, and not, not complicated, grammatically complicated enough. So I play with my students uh, WH questions. So if I say, okay, I'm, list, I'm thinking about an animal, you can ask me questions, but uh, these questions have to start with, uh, thank you, Baram. <laughs> the, the questions have to start with WH. So you can ask me, what does it eat? Where does it live? How does it move? And I can answer the questions to you so that you can guess what animal I'm thinking about. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated, the structure of the WH each question is always problematic and uh, can be practiced like all the time, whatever topic you're talking about, right? Um, looking for patterns, okay? Uh, so if you want to play a little bit, um, if, if you have time and you see the need to increase a little bit the um, awareness of the language, of the structure with the students, um, you can look for uh, modern language aptitude tests. They are language independent. So um, they are just uh, form. They are focused on forming new languages. You can also ask, ask GPT Chat. It will prepare uh, such examples for you in no time. Uh, now this is the idea in which you have to um, analyze the example. So the context you are given the context, and you have to come up with something novel, something new. Okay. So if you are looking at them, and that's green tea, green water, and hot water, you need to establish what's green in these sentences what's water what's tea and what's hot in order to make hot tea okay so i don't know if you've been doing it and i know that we have very limited time so i will show you but uh you you could just have a look and and um uh, and see whether whether you can make hot tea out of this context that would be hot tea. Uh, yes <laughs> lovely thank you renata well done uh yeah this, this is how you do you can play like that with the children especially those that have problems with noticing patterns okay i'm sure you've got those students i've had them all my life there's always a student like that that you give an example sentence and they have to write a sentence by analogy and they can't because they can't see the the, the how it works they can't can't see the pattern okay so that's like the idea that you can use for them to increase the um awareness the language awareness or a change of events detectives in action uh collaborative story when you are practicing narrative tenses right this is nothing special you just start a story like uh, it was a beautiful uh, summer night when sandra went out from her house and you throw a ball to someone else and they have to continue practicing narrative tenses cause effect change or second for second conditional for example this is a game that i like with my students you don't need to prepare anything you just make a second conditional like, for example, if I had a lot of money, I would buy a car. And then the next person has to start with the second part of your conditional. So they start, if I had a car, I would travel to France. 
Okay, and then the next person has to start with the second part. So if I went to France, I would marry rich and so on. Yeah, and they continue. They they like it. It's creative and it's practicing the second conditional, but focusing on the meaning rather than form. Um, trigger response chains. Okay, so I've got uh, what you need is to prepare. Um, little visiting cards or ask the students to do so where they have the time the activity and the time with a question mark the person who's got the orange one or however you want to uh, indicate it starts and they ask what are you doing next week or what were you doing last year or whatever whatever you're practicing we are practicing future so i was doing um uh, what are you doing next week and anyone in the class who's got next week in the first line has to answer I'm getting married next week, okay? And ask the next question, right? What are you doing on Monday? And the person who's got on Monday on their cards has to answer, I'm having a baby. And what are you doing tomorrow? And you needed to loop it, okay? So when you are preparing those cards, so the last last person has to loop with the first person, right? So this one, if, if they ask, what are you doing tomorrow? The first person will answer, I'm going to London tomorrow, okay? Fun to do, very simple, and they they really like it. And it's like looking for who's got who's got the the answer to my question, right, around the classroom. And uh, one that I love and always um, promote is the second uh, is the two headed fortune teller. Two students, you tell them that they are one person with two heads, one fortune teller. You ask a question like, "Where am I going to live in the future?" And they have to answer, but each head can say only one word at a time, so it goes like. Uh, you will live in a big old castle, okay? You can ask students if they're older to make those sentences as long as they can, okay? So they are learning the structure of the sentence because what they want to say next is not what they planned, but they have to sort of adjust to what the person said just before them, which is fun with all age groups, but with children, it works well. And for some reason, it's hilarious when you ask how many children will I have, and they come up with you will have 120 children. No, no, not so, not so funny, but they like it. Uh, okay. Um, what we are looking at in the classroom, what our students are looking at little detectives, they are not looking for serious things, and we shouldn't make grammar serious. Okay, we have this tendency to come into the classroom and say, okay, fun is over. Today, we are going to look at something very serious. We are doing past simple. Okay, don't. They, they are interested in fun and we can sort of smuggle this grammar in a fun way. So we are going to have a look at investigative techniques of um, grammar taught by fun. Okay, so for example, here we are teaching the contrast between um, present continuous and uh, present simple. So you've got activities that you do always and activities that you're doing now, right? So you're taking one with a clock and one with now, and you are opening them and you're saying like, for example, um, at 10 o'clock, he always learns maths, but now he's riding a bike, okay? So this is like hmm, investigating what's happening in the life of Mark or Jane or whoever it is. Uh, very simple activity, children will have fun um okay and um all the interrogations which is a, an investigative techniques for young um, grammar detectives is when you are doing any interviews or like a mixed activity with with um, all students asking each other questions now the questions have to be form first okay and then that's the focus on form the focus on form is about the grammar Mm, and the, the structure and then there is focus on the meaning when they are walking around and trying to actually get the information from other people um uh, also looking for clues an activity in which you are giving the students a picture or you can make it yourself or you can use any ready-made materials that you can find um there's a picture and you have to fill in the gaps in the text based on what you can see in the picture okay so it's like following the clues and trying to find the elements in the picture, which is also important for those of you who are preparing your students for the external exams, for example, Cambridge starters or movers flyers, because there is an activity like that when you've got a picture and you have to look for the clues, okay, and answer the questions. So now, you know, at the exam, it's a serious thing. While we are in the classroom, you can pretend that we are looking for clues because we're detectives and it's fun. Um, okay, a, a web page that I like and I want to share with you is the detective stories. 
case. Uh, here you've got uh, lots of lots and lots of different very simple very short stories which you have to explain okay so in this particular one uh, they're sitting in the dark room and, and something happens and you need to say how did that happen how did they know i like this one particularly because it gives clues okay so if you click on clues you're going to get three clues and if you can't uh, guess after the first one you've got second and third one and then there is an answer of course as well and we can we can play um, actual detectives okay with this with these stories um, establishing connections is another idea a very good one also you don't need to have anything really uh, other than flashcards for example of whatever you're using we are establishing uh, connections by taking two random pictures and saying what do they have in common okay so in this particular case is um it's jobs right so you can take i don't know randomly you can take a cook and i don't know and a mechanic what do they have in common and the students have to use their critical thinking abilities and creativity to come up with a feature that joins those two people but they can be you know different types of food uh different clothes uh they can be random um, flashcards from the whole semester and you have to find something that connects them because this is what detectives do usually right they find some evidence and they try to connect this evidence to the person or one piece of evidence to another um drawing conclusions is another technique of investigation so um, we can look at um other areas of uh, child development here we are looking at science development and uh here we see Mm, uh, the, the conditional, we are practicing the conditional, of course, but we are focusing on meaning. And this is something that actually the, the experiments are very simple. You can actually do them in the classroom, but you don't have to. You can you can rely on students' creativity and uh, create, uh, critical thinking. And when you can see the uh, immediate creativity below, so the students are practicing asking those questions, but they also try to find an explanation, okay, which is very detective-like and quite advanced at that. So we've been looking at grammar, and I would like you to, to leave this uh, virtual room thinking that grammar is absolutely not boring. And when children are young, they don't have any previous experience. They don't have the bias. So don't tell them that it's difficult. Don't tell them it's hard. Tell them it's fun, that it's something that carries meaning, that meaning is uh, expressed through grammar, that grammar has both form and meaning. And that's, that's very important to know. And that you can deduce uh, the grammar structure and how it works and what it means, or you can induce when you give them a lot of examples. You can actually give them real life examples. If you have highly, I do that. When I have a highly demotivated group, I print out lyrics from songs and I tell them, okay, underline the new structure in the lyrics that we are learning now. And they underline it. And then this is how they're, they're starting to be motivated because they can see that this grammar actually is present somewhere and is useful for them personally somehow. Um, and yeah, and, and try to put your detectives in action. So they've got a lot of activities that are fun, that are games, and that they can uh, do, uh, they can use this newly learned um, structure immediately after they've learned it. Yeah, don't, don't worry about them not having this structure well practiced yet. Okay, just give it to them and start practicing and see, maybe they will have this immediate creativity and use a lot, a lot of games and activities that will make uh, learning grammar more fun and less boring so that the students will enjoy grammar for life because education never ends. And as Sherlock says, it's a series of lessons with the greatest for the last. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> well, she is a great specialist, isn't she? Yeah. Anya, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, I, I kept, you know, looking at, uh, at, at the teachers making all kinds of uh, comments and also uh, putting questions in the chats and, uh, and now look at all the hearts. Uh, springing onto the screen uh thanks ever so much i think it was a great start to week two uh, you know one thing that uh, perhaps you would like to uh amplify uh, in response to one question that got asked by an anonymous uh mm -hmm. um, participant is um he or she worried that uh, perhaps explicit grammar teaching whether inductive or deductive ultimately will lead to explicit 
understanding of grammar and does this help the actual production right uh, mm -hmm. but i started as a lover of inductive teaching and uh, implicit presentation of grammar and for a very long time i thought it's the only way and it's the only right way and i i actually saw that it was very effective but with time i met students even very young ones that had a different mindset okay it doesn't mean that they had that they had a wrong mindset they were like yeah. more mathematical more scientific minded and for them this explicit teaching of grammar was actually important because I, I'm not sure whether it was important for their usage of this grammar, but for their comfort of using it. So they actually, they, they probably could learn implicitly as well, but they actually needed this comfort of knowing that they understand how it works, because this is how they lived, like real life. They wanted to understand how everything worked. And and for, for these students, I thought that uh, I found out quite late, I have to admit shamefully uh but i i decided to introduce both because you will have in the classroom students who are like that and 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 uh students who would like to discover and students who would like to be given so i would i would recommend starting with the discovery technique and then summing everything up with the with the uh, with the deductive uh, teaching with the explicit um, grammar teaching so for those who don't like to be given the rule first they have already reached the conclusion they are already there and for those who want and need to have the rule they will get it at the end so we don't forget about those thank you thanks ever so much anya uh if you could stop sharing your slides please so we can push on uh uh, but thank you very much once again. If you want to listen again, of course, there will be a recording available. And uh, if you would like to catch Anya live uh, with this session, of course, we are repeating this today, later on in the afternoon. So uh, uh, there's another chance to uh, pick her wonderful, enthusiastic brain. Anya, thank you very much and see you in the afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. <laughs> All right, and uh, uh, let us go back to the program. Uh, you will have noticed, as I already said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to share the screen here. <laughs> uh, uh, you will have noticed that uh, uh, Anya made several references to uh, uh, um, a course which uh, 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 which is Academy Stars, and uh, um, I would like to just uh, uh, reference this briefly for you. There it is. Uh, uh, the course, uh, as you can see, uh, um, as I hope that she also persuaded you to, uh, is one where um where um we, we had a chance to see a lot of examples of how uh you know developing a, an awareness of a grammatical system which is a challenge can be made really creative using some of those uh uh, uh techniques that uh anya has already showed and the academy stars um uh, in its second edition already uh, introduces even more grammar's practice with uh, uh, graphic grammar, animations, and various uh, creative communicative activities. Uh, th this ensures, in turn, that grammar learning is both educational and truly entertaining to these young learners. Um, Graphic grammar animations in particular uh, bring those grammar rules to life, uh, making, as Anya argued beautifully, making abstract concepts tangible and enjoyable to those uh, young learners of ours. Uh, in turn, grammar boosters and extra star activities uh, inject enthusiasm uh, and turn grammar practice into lively interactions for young learners uh in sum if you would like uh to explore this even further uh uh make sure that you embark your 
with your learners on this uh, uh, exciting journey of uh, uh, of grammar exploration. And then one of the best ways, I hope, is to scan the QR code, which is showing in the bottom right hand corner of the screen and uh, uh, get familiarized even more with the solutions in uh, Academy Stars second edition.